After listening to this presentation, you will understand how the CRD sewage plan in Amendment Number 8 fails to achieve the goals set up by the BC Ministry of Environment. You will also discover an approach to a solution to this problem that can be achieved by the December 31st, 2020 federal deadline. As of today, McLaughlin Point has been rezoned by the Township of Esquimalt, but the rezoning bylaw contains unanticipated amenities costing millions more. Despite a plea by the Township to hold off on the release of the request for proposals until the end of their public hearing process, the CRD Sewage Commission released the RFP the weekend before the Township ruled on the rezoning bylaws, creating further complications. The CRD then requested that the province intervene, invoking Section 37 of the Environmental Management Act, but the Minister refused, instead asking the CRD to work it out with the Township. We are here today to look at Director Derman's motion in detail. Director Derman, members of this committee, and others within the greater community see a sewage plan with substantially limited environmental gains and less than optimal financial outcomes. His motion also makes reference to a divisive approach inconsistent with the CRD's mandate, which has resulted in part in a lack of public confidence in the CRD. Perhaps more important is the fact that the public has now focused its attention on this project. Several citizens' groups are well informed and now highly attuned to the project's deficiencies. The media has become highly critical and skeptical of the outcome. The viewfield misstep has increased public awareness tenfold, and many have a great concern that a billion dollars will be spent and still not achieve tertiary level treatment. In December 2007, former Environment Minister Barry Penner wrote the CRD and laid out the following sewage treatment objectives for it to follow. Number one, meet the provincial regulatory standard. This will partially be achieved by moving to secondary treatment. Two, minimize costs, maximize economic benefits, reuse of resources and offsetting revenue. The sewage plan fails to do this, providing little to no resource recovery. Number three, optimize distribution of infrastructure. There should be little argument that McLaughlin and Heartland are not optimal locations. Penner continued, Number four, aggressively reduce greenhouse gases and pumping. The present plan involves 36 kilometers of new piping and several pumping stations. Number five, optimize smart growth. And the minister makes specific reference to Dockside Green, yet there is nothing in Amendment 8 like this. And finally, he wrote number six, examine opportunities to save money, transfer risk, and add value. The CRD plan has the public paying for the collection and treatment of sewage, but then hands this over to the private sector to profit from, throwing away its investment. And where's the innovation? The entire project has been specified by CRD staff. So the final score in Amendment Number 8 is at best 1 out of 6, and not very good. Let's examine the unknowns. First, the cost estimate is based on a 2010 figure. Because of the design-build process, the cost is largely unknown. The outcome is unknown, because the front end is being designed before the back end, and neither site has a development permit. What is the plan for the sewage sludge that will be produced? It's unknown at this time. By design, the project offers little benefit for the cost, yet comes with environmental drawbacks. The greatest limitation is that the project will be built around secondary treatment, which is only designed to deal with the organic component of sewage that the ocean has little difficulty assimilating. At least 50% of the toxins will continue to flush into the ocean, according to CRD staff, after this project has been completed. Future upgrades will be necessary and costly to meet ever more strict environmental standards, and the achievable energy recovery is limited to about 10 watts per household, generated at a yearly loss to taxpayers of approximately $15 million. However, the greatest problem faced to date has been where to locate facilities. Years of searching, justified complaints from residents, the elimination of ALR land options, and an early decision to avoid expropriation has resulted in two less than ideal sites. The siting problem stems from attempting to bring a heavy industrial process to residential neighborhoods that are up to 100 years old. Looking back to Viewfield, the current stalemate over McLaughlin Point, despite the Section 37 advice from CRD staff, and the problems ahead with Heartland, it is clear that even after seven years, the search continues for more suitable locations. Siting to date has proven extremely difficult. So what is one solution to this nightmare of siting? What do we know that has worked to date? Let's first look at the Curry Road pumping station in Oak Bay. The photo on the left shows the industrial pumps located inside this cleverly disguised pumping station. What about the outward appearance? It looks just like any other house in the neighborhood and can be directly viewed from the balcony of the Windsor Pavilion. In fact, during the biosolids open houses that took place last June, CRD staff were pointing to this pumping station 
as a prime example of how to blend into the surrounding neighborhood. The key to its success is its footprint. So Curry Road is an accepted community standard, but it's just a pumping station. What about a treatment plant done on a small scale? The other accepted community standard is Dockside Green, a tertiary treatment plant hidden in plain sight. CRD staff have relied on several misconceptions to downplay the merits of this award-winning facility. First, staff have said repeatedly that 600 Dockside Green plants would be required to provide sewage treatment for the core area. This is based on the false assumption that Dockside Green can only treat the effluent from the 270 on-site suites, about 500 residents. In fact, Dockside is designed for the entire build-out of 2,500 residents or more, as the development is not yet finished. This is an aerial photo of the Dockside Green site as it exists today. And this is what the full build-out will look like, supporting 2,500 residents, almost 10 times the existing installation. The Dockside Green plant has a higher capacity than first thought, and therefore it will take far less than 600 treatment plants to service the core area. How many would it take? Between 15 and 20 sites, half of which could be built onto existing pumping stations. We have also been told that the xenon membrane technology at Dockside Green is too expensive when replacement comes. These membranes are installed in cartridges and suspended in the sewage. To add capacity, you add additional cartridges, and not only is it in use at Dockside Green, but also at the Sioux Carver House Hotel. This is a photo of the cinder block building housing the tertiary treatment plant at the Sioux Carver House. Yes, tertiary treatment. It is a small facility, mostly empty, with treatment occurring below ground level, beneath the walking grate you can see in the photo. Here's a photo of one of the three membrane cartridges used at the facility, and this one is the spare that is being cleaned. This is the same technology as the one used at the CRD treatment plant on Salt Spring Island at Ganges. So, returning to the Sioux Harbor House, this is a photo of the technician filling a cup with the treated water that the plant produces. And in this photo, you can witness the result of treatment. This water can be drunk, although technically it does not meet drinking water guidelines. And at the Sioux Harbor House, it is used for irrigation and flushing toilets, just like Dockside Green. So this begs the question, if the Sioux Harbor House can afford this technology, why can't the CRD? The short answer to this is that it can. So why hasn't this been pursued as a possibility? And finally, the third misconception, that it will cost $2 billion for a decentralized model. This idea was predicated on the assumption that you would need 10 plants costing $200 million each. This estimate should be suspect right away, given that a single plant at McLaughlin is estimated to cost approximately $200 million. If Dockside can treat wastewater for 2,500 residents for a $4 million construction cost, 250,000 residents should cost 100 times as much, or $400 million, shouldn't it? Maybe less. Why not find out? So what are the lessons learned? We can look to Curry Road and Dockside Green as prime examples of effective solutions to citizens' concerns. In addition to solving the current siting problems and stalemate, what are some of the advantages of a decentralized tertiary system? Number one, meeting anticipated 2040 regulations by adopting tertiary treatment now. Number two, implementing both short and long-term plans for water reclamation and reuse. Number three, there will be an actual environmental improvement over marine-based treatment now. Number four, decentralized systems can be cost-effective and adaptable to future needs. And finally, number five, who else can build a system nearly from scratch? Other communities have heavy investments in their primary and secondary treatment plants. We don't have this burden. We can leapfrog them. But we're not done yet until we revisit the ministry objectives laid out earlier and test them against the decentralized approach, remembering that Amendment Number 8 only scored a possible 1 out of 6. Number 1. Meet the regulations. Yes, in fact, we'll be ready for 2040. Number 2. Minimize cost, maximize benefits. I think that's possible. Number 3. Optimize distribution. Definitely. Number 4. Aggressively reduce greenhouse gases and pumping. A big yes. Number 5. Optimize smart growth. Another yes. Just add more xenon cartridges, expand or build new plants as needed. And six, examine opportunities to save money, transfer risk, and add value. A possibility for sure. So the score? Six out of six. The Minister of Environment would no doubt be delighted that the CRD had met every one of these objectives. So what about a timeline for a rollout of a decentralized system? Construct 15 to 20 plants by 2020. Half of these could be built where pumping stations exist today. 
During the next 20 years, new subdivisions get a purple pipe to access reclaimed water, while older neighborhoods acquire the same service at the same time inevitable storm drain repairs are effective to minimize digging costs. By 2040, the majority of residences will have access to recycled water for irrigation and plumbing. Contrast that to the CRD plan that will simply flush secondary treated water out to sea through a new marine outfall. And decentralized or not, any plan must meet the criteria of the right plan, spelled R-I-T-E. R, respectful of communities, I, innovative, T, taxpayer friendly, and E, environmentally sound. These criteria are a minimum to win public approval, and it just makes sense. Now that we looked at some alternatives, let's examine the current project in detail. First, the financial impact to the local economy from this project. Seven core area municipalities, 137,000 residences, $309 per door average, $42.5 million per year, $1 billion over 25 years of the loan. That's the CRD estimate and how much money CRD taxpayers are being expected to fork over during the first 25 years. These figures already account for federal and provincial contributions. Now here's where the CRD plan really goes off the rails. CRD staff say the plan costs $309 per door on average, with Saanich and View Royal with the lowest bills and Oak Bay nearly double the other two. This is also the price before Colwood or any other member municipalities exit. Now we've been led to believe that the dockside approach is cost prohibitive. But in fact, the bills from the Dockside Strata Corporation show that the per dollar cost for Dockside is $362 for tertiary level treatment. That's on par with the CRD figure, but you only get secondary level treatment for $309. When you look into the CRD reports, you'll discover that the actual cost per door is far, far higher than stated. This is the number one reason why the CRD must conduct an independent review before going any further. The CRD average figure of $309 per door is wrong because of two glaring omissions. In April of 2012, the CRD Finance and Corporate Services Committee asked for a 50-year life cycle for this project. This was referred to the Core Area Liquid Waste Management Committee, and in May 2012, CRD staff wrote a report and recommended against undertaking a $20,000 life cycle cost analysis, which isn't a great sum considering the million spent to date. Instead, the committee relied on an older February 2011 analysis that only costed the project out to 2030, a mere 13 years after the earlier 2017 completion date for this project. As a result, this has eliminated 74% of the life cycle, 37 years, and 48% of the debt on the 25-year loan, 12 more years. This is what you get when you add up all of the missing costs. You start with the 309 figure and add back $28 for the biogas sales, expected by 2030, and you get a starting cost of $338 per door. Now add in $205 for that missing portion of the debt that was highlighted in a previous slide, and you get $543 per door. But we're not finished, because there are annual operating and maintenance costs of $133 that are sometimes included and sometimes not in CRD reports, for a total of $676 per door. Remember the previous slide that showed $309 per door actually came to $1 billion over 25 years? That means $676 per door will cost more than $2 billion over 25 years, and the cost for Oak Bay will be even higher. And if that weren't enough, there is no funding for storm drain repairs, estimated at $400 million, that municipalities are going to have to pay for it themselves. All of this is clearly unaffordable for this region, and all you get is secondary level treatment and no water reuse. And these are the residential rates. Imagine what the business rates will be. Beyond the staggering costs, remember that the federal 2020, 2030, and 2040 deadlines roughly depend on the level of treatment that exists presently. We are on preliminary treatment, so we have to upgrade by the first deadline. However, we can logically expect that all secondary treatment plants will be expected to upgrade to tertiary treatment after 2040, and the CRD plan will flush the product of that treatment, reusable water, out to sea at McLaughlin Point through the new marine outfall. Why are we wasting such a precious resource? Isn't that what resource recovery was all about? Recovering resources? And what about the chemicals left soluble in that water? Secondary treatment will continue to flush 50 to 90 percent of pharmaceuticals, personal care products, cleaners, and worse, into the ocean for the next 20 years. And for this limited gain, there are still great risks. Number one, piping a sewage slurry 18 kilometers to Heartland will be challenging. Number two, the great potential for overruns due to the need to cross the harbor entrance. Number three, a new marine outfall will be needed at McLaughlin. 
Number four, discovery of native artifacts along Dallas Road will cost millions. Number five, all overrun costs must be borne by CRD taxpayers alone, possibly just five of the seven municipalities. And number six, the second red flag for this project, continued wet weather overflows. At the McLaughlin public hearing last month, a letter read by the chair acknowledged that a wet weather facility was eliminated from the design a few years ago on the approval from the province. A wet weather facility treats rainwater that enters the sewage system that cannot be processed by the main treatment plant because the volume is so great. At times, this flow is up to 36 times the dry weather flow, far beyond the capacity of the pipes or the treatment plant. The dated 2010 design in Amendment No. 8 will fail to meet the newer and more strict 2012 federal regulations, which are designed to eliminate ocean discharges. In other words, during heavy rains, the CRD will be in violation of the federal regulations, meaning that the system built by 2018 may last only three years. This diagram is a very simple schematic of the infrastructure that is planned. The long blue line on the left depicts the new marine outfall at McLaughlin Point that the CRD plans to construct. The darker line running along Dallas Road cannot carry the excess rainwater from the Clover Point pumping station to the McLaughlin plant and will be discharged out of the new marine outfall that will be retained at Clover Point, shown by the shorter blue line on the right. When this issue was raised by the public with CRD staff, it was expressed by staff that it was hoped that the federal government didn't notice this, but this seems unlikely. The CRD clearly cannot spend $783 million by its own account in order to target the federal regulations only to fail to achieve regulatory compliance not long afterwards. This is a stunning oversight that will result in fines, end up in court, like the Greater Vancouver Sewerage and Drainage District on August 7th of this year, or significant cost overruns for CRD taxpayers will be incurred as a consequence. This is how overruns rack up. The costs increase as the design changes during construction. So proceeding with Amendment Number 8 is risky. The cost has been underestimated, and the system isn't compliant with federal regulations. A desirable outcome requires reconsideration of this plan in the form of a thorough independent review. Plus, there have been many developments since the start of this project. For example, Dockside Green has established itself as a local success. There is ample time to alleviate the problems of the current situation. First, the federal deadline is December 31, 2020, which is 33 months from the anticipated completion date of Amendment Number 8. This is more than enough time, given that the current project developed within the same time frame, yet we are much wiser now for having gone through it. Second, because the operating costs of the planned project exceed inflationary costs, it actually pays to delay implementation as long as possible while still targeting the 2020 deadline. Minister Polak has offered flexibility until 2020, and Minister Oakes is even open to an extension if the CRD brings forward a project with greater benefits. They have both stated that funding is secure, so risk is minimal. In addition, it is not well understood that under the law, the CRD has only a statutory requirement to provide a liquid waste management plan, not to build a sewage system. This allows cities, especially in growth areas like Colwood and Langford, to go and build their own treatment system under an amendment to the liquid waste management plan. Because the current plan allocates 17% of the system capacity to these two cities, the associated costs will have to be borne by the five municipalities that remain wed to the system if Colwood and then Langford were to exit. In summary, the Minister wants the best possible outcome. We all do. What is needed is a process and a plan that mitigates all of the noted problems. Flexibility in funding and timing is available up until the end of 2020. The Minister stated she will not invoke Section 37. Given the Minister's refusal to invoke Section 37 and her offer of flexibility, it's hard to imagine a more risk-free situation than right now. Based on everything you've heard in this presentation and more, please support Director Derman's motion by taking the following action. Step 1. Initiate a truly independent review of the project and immediately issue a new request for expressions of interest to get the ball rolling. Step 2. Withdraw the RFP while you can. Its release was premature. By following this path, we can hope to achieve genuine benefits for the community, maximize environmental gains and optimal financial outcomes, Minimize divisiveness through newly found cooperation. Minimize the potential that Langford will exit the plan. Address citizens' concerns creatively and equitably. Secure a mandate with widespread public support. Restore the tarnished image of the CRD. And finally, strive to meet all six ministry objectives. Imagine how it would feel to garner accolades from both the province and feds after making the CRD a world-class leader in sewage treatment. Let's make Greater Victoria a sewage treatment success story 
and not a sensational story of cost overruns. Fortunately for all, there is no shovel in the ground yet, and a brighter future for sewage treatment awaits the capital region. Thank you for listening to this presentation.